While in exile on Tatooine, Obi-Wan Kenobi did his best to avoid drawing attention to himself as he quietly watched over the young Luke Skywalker. However, he did struggle with inactivity and ignoring the duties of a Jedi. Since Tatooine was a pretty rough place and was under the control of Jabba the Hutt, there were times over the years when Obi-Wan was forced into action. During the time of the Great Drought, Obi-Wan had to rescue Luke from Jabba's thugs after the young boy had tried to stop them from taking water taxes from the moisture farmers. However, Obi-Wan's actions would later have violent consequences. The story I want to jump into today comes from the canon 2015 Star Wars comic series in the Journals of Obi-Wan Kenobi arc, telling stories from his years on Tatooine. Unfortunately, Obi-Wan found himself face to face with the Wookiee bounty hunter Kersantan, and to say that the Jedi Master was out of practice would be an understatement. A year after the Great Drought and his run-in with Jabba's thugs, Obi-Wan was doing his best to return to the life of a hermit, since Jabba was still desperate to find the mystery man that had attacked his men. Obi-Wan began to work for the Jawas, defending them from Tuskens, and he had the Jawas give Luke parts to fix his T-16 Skyhopper after Luke had crashed it in Beggar's Canyon. Obi-Wan did this because he felt that there would be a day that Luke would need to fend for himself and he'd need a speeder of his own to fly away with. However, an infuriated Uncle Owen returned the parts, saying that he knew Obi-Wan had been watching over their farm ever since he brought Luke to them. He mentioned that the Lars farm was the only homestead that hadn't been attacked by Tuskens for years, and now Jawas were giving them stuff for free, so he knew that Obi-Wan was behind it all. He told Obi-Wan to stay away from Luke and that they did not want his help. Meanwhile, Jabba the Hutt hired Kersantan to find the man who ambushed his water tax collectors. Jabba's thugs showed the Wookiee where the incident had happened, explaining that no one saw anything or who did it. Kersantan noticed that the Lars farm was nearby, and he went there. Inside, he abducted Uncle Owen, assuming that he had some connection to the mysterious man he was hunting. Luke had run away from home, but he felt a kind of disturbance, a feeling, and ran back to the farm, where he found Aunt Beru. She told him that some creature had taken Owen and headed for the canyons, and she instructed Luke to hide in the maintenance bay. On a cliff, Kersantan shocked Uncle Owen to make him scream, which of course drew Obi-Wan's attention immediately. He was meditating in the Dune Sea when he felt a disturbance in the Force. Standing atop the cliff face to face with Kersantan, Obi-Wan tried to slow his breathing to hide how tired he was from the climb. Looking at the Wookiee, he felt fear in his gut and felt that the pain had gotten worse with age. Obi-Wan said that he knew who Kersantan was, and he guessed correctly that Jabba had hired him. He tried to use a mind trick on the Wookiee to make him leave Tatooine, but it didn't work, and Kersantan sent him flying. When Obi-Wan tried to reach for his lightsaber, the Wookiee took a giant bite out of his arm. Kersantan held him over the edge of the cliff by the throat, but threw him back down, and Obi-Wan assumed that he was worth more alive, which is why Kersantan wouldn't kill him. He trapped Obi-Wan under an electrified net, and when Owen tried to help, Kersantan sent him flying off the edge where he clung to the rocks. In pain, being electrocuted by the net, Obi-Wan reached out with the Force and begged Qui-Gon's spirit to guide his hand. He blinded Kersantan with dust and sand, then broke free of the net and stacked large rocks on top of Kersantan with the Force. But when he tried to reach Owen, he turned to see Kersantan enraged, holding one of the boulders over his head. Igniting his lightsaber, wondering if he was still enough of a Jedi to stop him, Obi-Wan somersaulted over the Wookiee and slashed the boulder in two, also leaving a long scar across Kersantan's left eye. At the same time, the small spire of rock that Owen was clinging to broke, and he began to fall. Obi-Wan attempted to hold him in place with the Force and guide him back to the rocks even as Kersantan continued to fight him. With one hand holding Owen, he tried to hold the Wookiee off, but he lost his concentration and thus his hold through the Force. Owen began to fall to his death, but out of nowhere Luke appeared, flying his Skyhopper and caught him out of the air. 
As they flew away, Obi-Wan thought to himself that he could feel the force flowing through Luke in that moment, the boy who would one day save them all. With Owen out of danger, Obi-Wan turned to finish his fight with the Wookiee. He deflected Chrysanthemum's bowcaster shots back at him, causing him to scream in pain. Kersantin backed up, still partially blinded and now freshly wounded, and he fell from the cliff. Down below, Luke and Owen hugged each other as Obi-Wan watched. Obi-Wan later wrote that he heard Kersantin had fled Tatooine since he failed Jabba. Obi-Wan and Owen did not say anything to each other about what had happened. They simply returned to their daily lives. So guys, I really like this story. I like this little run in the comics where it's just Obi-Wan's journals and he's talking about how sometimes he still had to jump into action on Tatooine. Honestly, stories like this are what I wished the Obi-Wan show would be like, where he's on Tatooine, he's doing stuff, he's protecting Luke. It's much more of like a small scale, small conflict just him protecting Owen and Beru and Luke and stuff. I really like stories like that. These stories in this comic remind me of the Legends Kenobi book where it's a much, much smaller conflict. He stays on Tatooine and it's just about him kind of trying to mediate a war between the Tusken Raiders and all of the moisture farmers. And he thinks about Luke and there's a lot of stuff about Anakin and Obi-Wan's processing what happened after Revenge of the Sith. But it's just him on Tatooine still being a hermit, but he is forced into action and he has to fight sometimes. And I don't want to give away everything that happens in the book, but it's a great book. And that's really what I wish the Obi-Wan Kenobi show was like. I think him leaving Tatooine in that show and like fighting Vader again, you know, whatever. I, I, I love that duel. Um, I don't really have a problem with that, but I just think that there was too much going on. I didn't like how Reva went to the farm and stuff like that. I, I think that a Wookiee bounty hunter, you know, stuff like that is much more appropriate because it doesn't really expose Luke to the Jedi and Sith and the Force and stuff. So that's what I like about this because it's still action, but it doesn't really contradict anything about Obi-Wan's exile and Luke's childhood, I feel like, if that makes sense. I just think... The stories that happened on those 19 years that Obi-Wan was on Tatooine should be a lot more like this. Tusken Raiders, Jawas, you know, Bounty Hunters, Jabba the Hutt, whatever. All stuff like that, that's awesome. I think that those are good areas of conflict for Obi-Wan to get into, and it makes sense that he's trying to be a hermit, he's trying to stay out of trouble, but sometimes he just can't because Tatooine is a very violent and difficult place to live. So. That's all that I have to say about this. I, I really like this story and I was excited to make this video. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching and as always, may the force be with you.